unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to the Grand Tamasha Podcast. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. We're excited to be back for a new season of timely commentary and analysis on Indian politics and policy. A quick programming note to let you know that we're updating the show's format for the new season. Each weekly episode will now be an interview or news roundup, but not both. We hope this change will allow for greater in-depth discussion now that the election season is behind us. With that, we hope you enjoy season two of Grant Masha. We've been off the air since June, so we have a lot to catch up on. Joining me back in the studio this week are Sadan and Dume, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and Thanvi Madan, senior fellow at uh, the Brookings Institution. Guys, welcome back to the show. Good to be back. Good to be back. I hope everybody's had a great summer. Um, so before we start, we have to discuss some uh, personal updates. Sadan, and since we last saw you, you have become a Netflix star. Apparently, tell us a bit more about your <laughs> turn on Netflix? Netflix star by proxy. Uh, you know, my former boss, Arthur Brooks, uh, made a documentary called The Pursuit, uh, which is really a bit about three countries. It's about uh, mostly about three countries, uh, India, Spain, and the US. And he sort of looks at poverty and uh, the role of free enterprise and alleviating it and so on. And so I have a bit part on in the India section of it. And this is a Netflix special. It's on It's on, it's on right now. now. People can go and watch it. And Thanvi, and not only have you been promoted, congratulations to Senior Fellow. Thank you. You also Mom. have an announcement forthcoming about a book. Tell us more about the book. I do. I just uh, finished looking at copy edits for my forthcoming book, which will be out in January 2020. Uh, it's called Fateful Triangle, How China Shaped U.S.-India relations during the Cold War. So look forward to a Grand Thamasha episode on Fateful Triangle, I hope, uh, come January 2020. Uh, On the show this week, we're going to discuss three topics. The Modi government's surprise decision to abrogate Section 370 of the Indian Constitution. What does it mean for Kashmir, for India, for the neighborhood? Uh, Then we'll discuss the sad state of the Indian economy, and we'll wrap up by talking about Prime Minister Modi's Independence Day address, which he delivered last week on August 15th. So let's start with the events uh, unfolding in Kashmir. After weeks of speculation that something really big was going to happen in Kashmir, on August 5th, the Modi government announced that it planned to use Article 370 of the Constitution to essentially gut Article 370 of the Constitution, thereby fully integrating Jammu and Kashmir into India and ending its 70 years of constitutional autonomy. So, Dhanan, let me start with you. There's a lot to unpack here, but maybe it'd be useful just to walk our listeners through what exactly the Modi government has done? So it's essentially done two big things. Uh, The first is that it has stripped the former state of Jammu and Kashmir of uh, a measure of autonomy that it enjoyed under the Indian constitution, at least in theory, if not in practice. The second is that it has ended statehood for Jammu and Kashmir and divided, uh, divided the state into the two different union territories which will be directly administered uh, by someone appointed by New Delhi. So it's a double whammy. So not only has well, so Jammu and Kashmir has gone uh, virtually overnight from being from enjoying at least in theory more autonomy than most of the rest of India to enjoying less. Now, you wrote a piece in the Atlantic which I want to quote from um, which describes a little bit the domestic and international ramifications of this move. And you wrote, quote, whatever the cocktail of ideology, domestic politics, and security concerns that drove India's decision, it does not change the fact that this move reveals a certain brittleness in Indian uh, in India's constitutional arrangements. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I'm getting a ton of flack of that on, for, on Twitter, as you can imagine, being accused of being anti-national by that you know great repository of excellence in journalism, Op India. Um, but, you know, in, in a, the, the question for me, and I think that this is something we're going to be discussing for a long, long time because the uh, ramifications are, you know, too vast to be unpacked over a matter of weeks or months, uh, is really how does India's, uh, how do India's democratic institutions deal with something like this? Now, I'm not a legal expert, and I'm sure that there are reasonable arguments about whether this is constitutional or not constitutional. Uh, But it's quite telling that the Indian Supreme Court has essentially ignored this for now. They've sort of put it off. Uh, 
uh, they're not willing to address it, right? They seem to be willing to address all kinds of things of great urgency, such as the height of a Dahi Handi in Mumbai during Janmashtami, <laughs> and whether or not India really urgently needs a direct flight from Delhi to Shimla. <laughs> but somehow this grand, this, this huge constitutional question with not just domestic, but also international ramifications is, is perhaps just not important enough to make it to the docket. Um, and so I, I think that the, 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 that's, that's one one issue. Uh, the other really is how uh, weak the opposition has been. Now, you had some opposition from the Congress, but even the Congress has been uh, really divided on this. And what happens, what seems to be happening is that uh, the government has made a popular decision. Let's make, make no mistake there, a very popular decision. It has much of the media on its side. And under these circumstances, when you have this you know, absolutely triple distilled populism uh, at play, do our op- opposition parties able to stand up and play the role of an awful responsible opposition, or will they be steamrolled? And the evidence here suggests that they can be steamrolled quite easily. So these are the kind of the two major ones. And of course, the third is the media, um, which has, you know, to a large extent, not counting a few, you know, principled people here or there, much of the media is just cheerleading this exercise. Uh, there is, hasn't been uh, too much uh, too much pushback, especially on television. So the question is whether you agree with this particular decision or not. Uh, the question is, if you were to apply, if you were to just look at the health of Indian institutions in the face of populism, what does this tell us about Indian democracy? I'd say it shows a certain brittleness. But surely some of that has to do with the way in which this decision was implemented, right? You essentially enact a lockdown of the state. You round up all opposition leaders. You put them under house arrest. You shut down the internet. You shut down landline phones. You essentially give them an information blackout. There's some people who have argued that, like demonetization, uh, your other favorite subject, that you couldn't have done this unless you caught people by surprise and you had to – these were the facilitating or necessitating, uh, necess- necessitating conditions. Um, do you think we can separate means from ends? No, I think – I, I actually disagree with you. I think that the, it's certainly true that the, that the harsh means that were used probably you know, amplify the importance of this issue. But it, to me, it's a sort of it's a simpler issue about whether or not uh, the average voter really con- uh, conceptualizes democracy as encompassing checks on executive power, or whether they really see uh, democracy as purely about the popular will. And that's what this is, you know, to me very, very starkly. And I think, I guess, demonetization was that also, uh, especially in the beginning, before people sort of, you know, finally woke up and realized that it was a disaster. Uh, but it, it is similar to that extent. How do you check? Uh, how do you check power? And I think what we're finding in India is that uh, the checks on executive power. Uh, at least under this government, are extremely limited. So, Tanvi, let me bring you in and ask you about the international implications of this move. You know, there's a lot of speculation that President Trump's musings or kind of loose talk about the U.S. mediating the Kashmir dispute between India and Pakistan could have spurred the Modi government to act. Um, in your mind, is there any truth, is there any connectivity between what President Trump is on the one hand and what India has decided to do in Kashmir? So I think, you know, some of the speculation that it was his uh, kind of Kashmir comment in particular that he, you know, would kind of love to get involved and mediate um, this, uh, that there's been some speculation that that itself sparked it. Um, I think what con- what is a contributing factor? I don't think that in and of itself sparked this or, or or dictated its timing. I think what did play a role is what essentially caused or facilitated the Imran visit itself, the, the visit of Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan and perhaps more importantly, the Pakistani Army Chief uh, General Bajwa, who just got an extension of three years. Their visit was was facilitated and frankly would not have been possible without the U.S. desire to draw down slash withdraw from uh, Afghanistan. And I think there is there has been a sense in India for a while. It's not like this has been a secret that this is coming. Uh, they were expecting this during the Obama administration as well. And so this idea that when a, a U.S. withdrawal or drawdown w- would require a certain amount of Pakistani cooperation or buy in. Uh, at least in the initial phase, to get certain fa- factions of the Taliban to the table, and then after that to help during the actual drawdown and withdrawal itself, if nothing else, by holding back some of its fire. 
uh, and that this U.S. need for Pakistan would then give Pakistan more flexibility, both in terms of expecting less pressure on itself for to contain some of these terrorist groups that attack India, uh, but also potential carrots as well. And so I think this this factor would have played into the Indian decision in terms of timing, maybe. I think they would have planned to do this regardless in a second term, because not only to have this kind of majority in the Lok Sabha, but coming pretty close to the a majority in the Rajya Sabha, maybe not a two-thirds, uh, but also getting a lot of opposition support on board. I think the other factor that might have played a role in terms of timing related to the Afghanistan-Pakistan uh, dimension is that the Indian government would have known that, yes, this might mean that Pakistan will then try to uh, either start using or you know pushing their proxy groups towards taking certain actions. But at the same time, there's a financial action task force uh, meeting later this fall, uh, which will could potentially blacklist Pakistan. So they know this is kind of timed in a way that it's before the U.S. drawdown. Uh, but it's also before this meeting, so that it could, t- uh, you know, contain some of these uh, tendencies. I want to ask you about the events in New York. At, at China's behest, the UN Security Council held a closed-door discussion on Kashmir. Uh, everyone suspected that Pakistan really was uh, was behind this, truly, given that uh, they're such uh, close allies uh, of China's. Uh, the Security Council decided at, at the end of that meeting not to convene a formal session on the matter, and this was been seen and has been hailed widely as a kind of master stroke for, for Delhi's diplomacy. Tell us a little bit more about the significance of what happened in New York. Um, so what is interesting is, I mean, in some senses, we've seen, we saw both after the um, terrorist attack uh, in uh, Pulwama in uh, Kashmir in the in February. It was a Valentine's Day attack, if I remember correctly. Um, and then in the Indian response then and the UN action around that, uh, and now with this UN Security Council, that um, we are seeing kind of uh, this these India-Pakistan issues come up at the UN again after a number of years. We haven't seen it for a long time. That in that sense, these issues are being discussed. Uh, but to me, what's been really interesting is what these debates, t- not that what they tell us about India-Pakistan bilateral relations, but what it tells us about uh, India's and Pakistan's relations with the major powers and where they stand uh, with geopolitically now in a way that's very different from where they were 20, 30 years ago. Um, so, yes, uh, Pakistan has got the backing of China. Uh, we're still trying to kind of figure out what Russia is doing. In- initially, it came out in support before this UN action was taken and said, look, this is India's internal matter, essentially gave the uh, Indian government point of view. Uh, But then around this UN Security Council closed session, we've seen kind of different views where on the one hand, they didn't push for an open session, uh, but they did apparently, at least from one report, the Russians kind of stayed silent um, on whether it didn't support or oppose the decision to even release the statement afterwards. Um, But also their UN kind of their UN uh, representative did use language about UN resolutions, etc. So it kind of tells you what Russia has been doing, which is playing a little bit more middle of the road than they used to, partly because they need Pakistan's support uh, and cooperation for uh, their interests in Afghanistan uh, as well. But on the other hand, I mean, look at the US. I think it says a lot that the, the countries that Indian commentators and diplomats at the UN who have seen as their biggest backers at the UN have been the US and France. Um, And outside this UN Security Council context, uh, you're seeing Pakistan's other, other than China, their main supporters used to be the Middle East countries, but particularly the Arab countries. But you've seen the Saudis, the UAE, uh, not really, not just not come to Pakistan's uh, defense, but or take its point of view, but actually actively side with India. And it's got to hurt Pakistan that, yes, the UN Security Council discussion uh, they couldn't get kind of a public statement from the council as a whole, from the uh, council president. The, the polls have the chair. Uh, but also the, this weekend, uh, Prime Minister Modi will be in UAE and he's been given the highest, highest civilian honor. So, you know, that kind of thing where at the end of the day, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, that one thing that tells you how people's con- these countries' fortunes have changed, all you have to look is uh, is at their GDP uh, numbers. So that was a great segue to the next segment. But before we go there, one last question for you, Sadanan. How do the Pakistanis respond to this? You know, they're in a bit of a tight spot. Um, they have very limited support. They have the support of China. They seem to have a certain amount of support 
uh, in the UK, where obviously there's a large Pakistani diaspora, uh, they would be very tempted to play the terrorism card. But that, of course, carries risk because of, of the uh, fat of sanctions. Uh, I think for now they're going to focus on the on on human rights and civil liberties. And frankly, so far at least, uh, in the Indian government has not exactly covered itself in glory. And uh, they are helped. Pakistan is helped to the extent that the the way this is being discussed in India is so, uh, I would say, hyper nationalistic and almost sort of blind to how uh, this is being viewed in the rest of the world. And I'd say that from an Indian perspective, probably the smartest thing they could do would be to restore normalcy. And by that, I mean uh, they've already started restoring phone lines, which is a good sign. Restore all the phone lines. Uh, release political prisoners. You know, by some accounts, they've arrested up to 4,000 people. Uh, lay out some kind of roadmap to toward normalcy that they can present to the international community. Um, and also perhaps uh, appoint as... A governor or now lieutenant governor, uh, since these are now union territories, figures who would, you know, perhaps attract some some amount of empathy or known for some amount of empathy for the Kashmiri people. I will say, I mean, one of the things is while we are at this point where the Indian government could be, uh, if not pleased, at least relieved at the way the the kind of international reaction has played out. Uh, when this is not the end. Uh, we will see Pakistani efforts at the UN General Assembly and probably, as is usual with Pakistan, a pretty uh, uh, vociferous speech by whoever the Pakistani kind of uh, by whenever the Pakistani prime minister gives his speech at the UN. But I think at the end, that might not matter as much to India. But what will could make a difference in terms of how the international community reacts and whether that could change from the current kind of quasi support to kind of sitting aside is one, how things play out, as Sadan is saying, in Kashmir. If you see kind of some level of violence, and particularly not just, you know, people, if people aren't allowed to protest, I mean, it is a democracy. This is what makes India different from China, after all, the uh, the ability to dissent uh, and the ability to pro protest, um, that if there is then kind of a violent response and there are images of this, etc., you start to then, this becomes a more public, uh, uh, you start to have this discussion again. And I think the second thing is, if India-Pakistan tension increases, then because of the nuclear aspect of both countries, that they are nuclear weapon states, then you do see kind of countries start to worry. We saw this during Balakot. As escalation was possible, suddenly you start hearing calls of restraint. On the flip side, if there is a major terrorist attack by groups that are seen as Pakistani proxies, then you could see that any support for Pakistan uh, could also switch that discussion internationally the exact opposite way, including from a country like China. So let's move to topic number two now, which is the economy. Uh, you know, across the board, analysts and economists are revising their projections for India's GDP growth downwards. The Economist this week published a piece titled India Inc. is growing disenchanted with Narendra Modi. The piece goes on to say that private sector players, quote, confide that the prime minister often asks not what the government can do for companies, but what they can do for the government. He's increasingly viewed not as broadly pro-market, but selectively pro-business. Um, Sadan, and let me turn to you. Is there a recognition in De Delhi that the economy appears to be heading south? And if so, do you think that they are developing a strategy that can counteract this kind of economic malaise that we're seeing? There certainly seems to be a recognition that things are heading south. Uh, I'm not sure if that means that they have developed a strategy or changed tack. Uh, you notice, for example, in the Prime Minister's uh, comments on Independence Day, he s spoke about the importance of wealth creators. Uh, this is probably in response to multiple reports that the tax authorities under this government have run amok and are practicing what is called tax terrorism. Uh, there is a general sense that uh, you know the promise of being more business-friendly uh, has really gone out the window, and instead, what we we went we ended up with is, in you know, probably the most uh, statist government that we've seen in a generation. Many businessmen are it's good. To, some of them are speaking out a little bit now, but this is not new for us who've been speaking. You know, people who've spoken to businessmen privately. Uh, this is just, it. and the fact that despite them being, you know, not not traditionally the most. Uh, courageous when it comes to speaking up to the uh, against the government. The fact that they're doing that now uh, just shows you how much they're hurting. 
Yeah, Thunbi, I want to ask you about that. I mean, it's been striking to me that in the last few weeks, we've seen a number of prominent business people come speak out against the government's handling of the economy. And that's something which Sadan just mentioned is quite rare in India, given the heavy hand of the state. So we've had Rahul Bajaj, Narayan Murthy, Kiran Mazumdar Shah, even Mohan Daspai, who's been a staunch backer uh, of the Modi regime, uh, particularly on social media. Uh, they've come out all with choice words about this government's kind of statist approach. Were you surprised by how outspoken they've been? And do you think it's going to have an impact? Uh, I was surprised, partly because of what Sadana says, that you don't tend to hear um, them them talking about their, their concerns publicly. Uh, will it have an impact? Yes. The question is, what kind of impact? I think to some extent, you've already seen an impact. I think particularly, you know, Sadanan's point that when the prime minister gave this Independence uh, Day speech, he said wealth creation because there's been not just these uh, business uh, persons kind of coming out and making these comments, but a number of people saying that the Indian budget reflected uh, this idea that wealth creation is bad. Uh, and that redistribution is where things uh, should be going. And so you heard the prime minister saying that, look, uh, we shouldn't be suspicious of wealth creators um, and we should respect them. And then he added, because if you don't have wealth, there's nothing to distribute, right? Um, which is actually fundamentally the point that I hope there's some thinking about, which is on the one hand, he is doing some, the prime minister has an important focus in terms of getting as we've seen in the past, you know, and, and you've written about Millen, which is some of these kind of service delivery, you know, toilets, um, gas connections, health and education, which people and voters care about. But all this has to be paid for, for somewhere, from somewhere. And where's that revenue going to come from? And what these kind of business folks are trying to say, and also foreign investors who've been concerned with some of the announcements from the budgets and the sense of unpredictability which is that, look, we need more predictability. We need an enabling environment, which the prime minister mentioned both predictability and creating enabling environments for business, but also for exports. But I think the key is going to be, do they listen not just to these concerns that, look, this is a problem and then say, look, in, in rhetoric, but in reality, does the policy reflect uh, the fact that they recognize that there is a connection between the wealth creation and the Indian state's ability to pay for uh, these kind of uh, uh, these number of social service projects that are worthwhile, uh, that are necessary to build up social infrastructure, uh, but need to be paid for and not just uh, by kind of trying to find uh, some of these other quick fixes to get revenue, uh, but but you know actually have kind of the 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 buy so to speak. Uh, grow. So I, I, I think, you know, we heard again in the Independence Day speech, this $5 trillion economy goal at the end of, I think he, he said at the end of his term, uh, you can't get there unless you're thinking about the economy in a fundamentally different way. The fact that even Indian business, which has not just traditionally been kind of cautious about speaking out, uh, but also has actually not minded the statist economy entirely, that they're speaking out. I, I do think and I hope that the government actually does take that concern seriously. So, Sadanand, we're hearing a lot of rumblings about what the government might do to kind of get the animal spirits and the economy going again. Uh, this morning, I saw a tweet that said that the finance minister has announced that they will gradually reduce the corporate tax rate from 30 percent to 25 percent. That's something that they had selectively applied to very small companies now, we don't know what the definition of gradually is, but uh, presumably investors will 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 put that in the in the positive side of the ledger. What are some of the signals that you're looking for that will tell you that they're really serious about the kinds of reforms India needs to be that five trillion economy to have the eight or nine percent growth that we saw, you know, a decade ago? I mean, I don't know how much more gradual they want to get because this promise of reducing corporate tax rates to twenty five percent, which would still be higher than they are in much of East Asia and higher, certainly much higher than they are in the United States, uh, was made, if memory serves, by Arun Jaitley in 2015. And they still haven't got to it. It's 2019. So what does gradual mean? Um, it's a, If they really were serious about it, she would say that, look, we made this promise and we're going to implement it. And here you go. Now, now your, tax, your taxes are down to 25%. Uh, my problem is, or my worry is rather, is that this is a government that is tends to find it difficult to distinguish between messaging and policy. Uh, 
And their instincts are very often, when sort of people start criticizing them, their instincts are to sort of find a way to uh, either intimidate the messenger or massage the message, as opposed to just trying to fix the core policy problem. Uh, she could do. She could reduce taxes, which she hasn't done. She could junk this, you know, idiotic uh, mandatory CSR that India has. This right? corporate social responsibility. Corporate, where, where this was actually something brought in by the previous government, where companies have to spend two percent of their profits on corporate social responsibility. Right. So, you know, Apple has to spend all it spends its time trying to make the best iPhone to compete with Samsung, but if an Indian competitor ever emerged, it would have to spend part of its time building toilets in some politician's constituency. And this sort of, to me, shows a kind of fundamental uh, inability to understand the most basic things about capitalism, that the profit motive actually is good for society. Uh, and so she could do many things. She could just sort of, she could rein in the the, the, the tax inspectors. Uh, she could uh, signal some seriousness about uh, labor reform. There are many, many things. I mean, the reform agenda at this point, uh, there's, 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 there's nothing really new in there, right? We've been talking about these things. A disinvestment for, for, privatization right. of Air India, which is your and favorite one, I think. Genuine disinvestment <laughs> and not this like ridiculous disinvestment, which is where you get one state-owned company to buy a stake in another state-owned company, right? So there are many ways they could sort of very clearly say that, look, we've turned a page and we understand the seriousness of this. Uh, so far, we've seen no evidence of that. Though uh, they are trying to uh, trying the privatization of Air India again, so maybe. Believe it when I see it. Uh, uh, Speaking of messages, I want to spend some time talking about our, our last topic, which is the Prime Minister's Independence Day speech. It's a speech that you guys have already referred to in the context of the Prime Minister's comments about um, the importance of wealth creation and wealth creators. Um, there were a number of interesting issues that came up during the course of the speech, which is you know, a speech that many people look to to kind of read the tea leaves of where the government's going. It was part kind of scorecard. It was part, I would say, score settling and getting some jabs in at the opposition, particularly on the Kashmir issue. And then part this kind of aspirational rhetoric about the future, which the prime minister is, is so good at. Thanvi, uh, let me start with you. What were some of the other messages that caught your attention during the course of this speech? So since I work in foreign and security policy, the, the one that stood out there was the announcement of India putting in place of chief, chief of defense staff. Uh, which, as my colleague Anit Mukherjee, who's based at RSIS in Singapore, has said, uh, is not a new... People have been discussing this since Indian independence, but particularly since the Cargill, post-Cargill commissions, which have talked about having kind of a first among equals amongst the military service chiefs. Um, and the idea... We, we don't have details about what this chief of defense staff's uh, role will be, uh, where... We have some sense of where they'll st stand in the hierarchy, which will be, um, uh, again, not formal announcement, but reports we're getting is a four-star um, uh, chief who will be a first amongst equals compared to the three service chiefs, um, that they will have charge of the reports coming out of some of the integrated commands, space, cyber, special forces. Um, but what we don't know is a little bit more about, you know, how much will they be responsible uh, for creating jointness, uh, for potentially what we what people have been waiting to see is can they actually get this uh, person in this position to be in charge of things like prioritization across services in terms of procurement, uh, in terms of also integrating training, and eventually moving towards kind of integrated command structures across the board. Uh, but it's a good, it, it has been a good sign. The one other thing that I would flag that st uh, struck me is kind of uh, two other things. One is on what's going to be the next big project, uh, which is uh, water. Um, if the, you know, if the last government was about uh, toilets, gas connections or energy access more broadly, uh, this next term for Modi seems to be getting piped water uh, to households um, within a kind of a, a, a time frame, and the, the government's putting a, a, a lot of money behind it. So I think that stood out. But the other thing was the political side, and it'd be interesting to get your sense of what you think about this, which was snuck in there, didn't get too much attention. Uh, but given what they did with Article 370, you can now imagine a whole host of things that weren't possible, but now could be with the kind of majorities they have, which is one nation, one poll, uh, which is this idea of holding... 
uh, all kind of India's elections at one go uh, rather than having staggered elections between center and state. So those are the three things uh, that stood out for me other than what we talked about earlier, which was the economic uh, promises. Yeah, I mean, I think one nation, one poll uh, constitutionally and legally has a number of issues that make it somewhat complex thing to unilaterally push through, especially because you have to deal with this thorny issue of um, if you align the calendars of state and national elections and a state government falls through a vote of no confidence or a coalition falls apart or whatever, what do you do uh, in the meantime? Do you keep that assembly in suspended animation? Do you, can you have a midterm poll? Um, so I imagine the, the, the legal contestability is quite high. Although one thing which wasn't explicitly mentioned, um, but uh, a former RSS uh, organizer uh, had a piece today in the print on this, is Uniform Civil Code, mm -hmm. basically saying that uh, the path is pretty clear if it's got, this government really wanted to move on abolishing the idea of separate personal laws for Hindus, Muslims, and others, uh, and moving towards a uniform civil code, not only do they have the momentum, but they probably have the popular uh, support to do it. Um, Sadan, and what what jumped out at, at so you? So I, I would agree on uh, on water and CDS as and the chief of defense, uh, defense staff being the sort of two of the big takeaways. The other one that I thought was intrigued by was his reference to population. And he really spent quite a lot of time talking about how people with small families must be honored and valued. And uh, this, to me, uh, I would not be surprised if what he is teeing up is some kind of population control bill or disincentives for lost, for large families. And uh, it, it, it's very much in keeping with uh, RSS thinking. And uh, if you sort of look at this, if, you, if you're looking at this speech to see what may, be, uh, what may be coming down the pike, uh, that's the one that I would add. I think the interesting twist on that is we've seen a number of states impose family planning restrictions if you want to contest local panchayat elections, that you can have no more than two children. Imagine if such a, a, a amendment was brought in for MPs and MLAs, uh, w but it's not out of the realm that something like that could not be at all. under consideration. But one thing, I mean, given the historical connotations of this, um, the last time there was serious discussion of population control was during the emergency and it was one of the things that turned people against it. I mean, people forget the emergency in the 70s wasn't necessarily popular uh, in the public, very, uh, very unpopular. But this was one thing that, you know, because it's such a personal thing. Um, I think, you know, it would be interesting because one, the, 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 the Indian uh, kind of the, the, the birth rates actually gone down. And you don't want to get into a situation down the line where China is where you don't have a replacement rate. Um, and you have kind of, and as it is, you have problems with female infanticide, et cetera, in particular states like Haryana, for example, though some say there have been some improvements. But the state that's actually had the highest birth rates is Uttar Pradesh. Bihar. Uh, and then and Bihar, yeah. So these are kind of, this is going to be sensitive because not just one community, it goes across the board. Um, but I will say just in terms of kind of a, 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 some, a policy that actually has helped bring the birth rate down in India, uh, which I wish there was more direct attention is female literacy. Yeah. And so, you know, I wish that actually got more. Are you more saying you believe that women should be educated? <laughs> uh, if I had something to throw other so, than my phone, which would old be... old-fashioned uh, notions. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, Misogynist. So before I kick you guys out, uh, I'm going to wrap up like we do every week and every time you guys are on by asking each of you to name a story coming out of India that people may not be paying attention to, but that they should be. Thunvi, do you have a nomination this week? I want to say one word, just one word. Plastics. Plastics. <laughs> um, so, no, I do. It's actually plastic. You're actually being serious. I'm being serious. Um, one of the more intriguing things that the prime minister brought up again in the Independence Day speech and actually put a timeline to in terms of a big bang thing that we might hear about, uh, which is he spoke against single use plastics. Uh, India has a huge plastics problem. You see this if you are uh, going in the outskirts of Delhi. There's this huge trash dump in Ghazipur. You go to like a beautiful place like Shikhavati, where there are these old havelis in Rajasthan. And then next to the right opposite, this huge dump of um, plastics. Um, but also ch choking India's rivers. You see this in the mountains everywhere. Um, 
And he's called for this. He's called in the past. His minister last year called for a ban of single use or phased out ban uh, of uh, phasing out of single use uh, plastic by 2022. Modi has now said there will be some sort of announcement on or by October 2nd, probably on October 2nd, which will be the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Um, so that's something which, you know, let's hope it's done in a planned it's a, it's a planned manner. There's some states that already have some of these um, uh, policies, but this will be a good thing, I think. And so that's my story out of India that could have actually huge ramifications for the environment, but also could potentially be a model for other countries if it's implemented as well as well. Um, I'll just quickly repeat what I said earlier. I think this population story is very interesting because there's a private member's bill that's been proposed by a, an RSS member who's been nominated to the uh, upper house of parliament. And, and I think that there's sort of something cooking over there. We're not paying enough attention to it. And I don't know what the contours will be. I doubt very much that we're going to go back to uh, mid-70s style forced sterilization. But I think that what was significant to me about the prime minister's speech, or one of the things that was significant, is that effectively he has enough capital to recreate a political debate about something that was has been regarded as politically toxic since uh, at least 1977. All right, Tanvi, best week, worst week. Who had the best and worst weeks in India, in your view? Uh, so uh, the worst week, uh, I would say, uh, kind of, if I'm going to say, the, let me do the foreign policy side. Um, if you're a supporter of Indo-British relations, you're not having a great week. And if you're an advocate for better relations uh, or changed relation, transformed India-China relationship, you did not have a good week because... I think their voting pattern at the UN Security Council suggests that there are underlying issues there, fundamental issues, both with China and to some a lesser degree the UK, which because of its own electoral politics um, and its desire to, I think, continue to try to solve Kashmir, having created the problem in the first place or at least helped create it, uh, it, it, it has had uh, kind of a, a bit of a problem. Best week, I think the BJP manifesto. Uh, maybe not the week, but the best few weeks, which is... Um, you know, as, as, as I think it's uh, people should take BJP manifesto seriously. In 98, it said that they were going to, uh, you know, test nuclear weapons and uh, have a nuclear test. And they did. Uh, and everybody was surprised. Um, they have this uh, this kind of adjustment of not revocation, but the uh, adjustment of Article 370 was also in in the manifesto. Um, and so we ignore them at our peril. I mean, it's like the whole conversation we've been having in America about, you know, do you take Donald Trump seriously, but not literally? And apparently you should be taking the BJP manifesto both literally and seriously because they've started to deliver on some of these core agenda items. Sadanan, worst week, best week? Let me stick with the foreign policy theme that uh, Tanvi ticked off and say, I'd say uh, the best week would be for U.S.-India partisans. Uh, you had this moment where of of you know great sort of international attention and basically at the UN, uh, the US very clearly and, and unambiguously uh, backed India when it counted. And the worst week is the obverse of that, which is of course you know India's uh, large group of panda huggers because you know how do they now go and explain to people that you know that there's there's any kind of logic in being somewhat equidistant or sort of so I'd sort of be curious to see what the sort of folks who've been you know going on and on about the importance of uh, BRICS for instance uh, what the, how they're going to sort of respond to the fact that not only did China uh, support Pakistan which is sort of fairly uh, predictable but the uh, vociferousness with which their ambassador at the UN came out and really kind of slammed India uh, and I think that sort of Anyone who is has been batting for a closer U.S.-India relationship uh, would see that as pretty uh, as a pretty interesting development. And of course, without any sense of irony, talking about human rights uh, issues, uh, forget what's happening in Xinjiang or Hong Kong. On that sunny note, uh, thank you guys both for coming. Uh, the idea for season two is uh, we'll do news roundups. I think maybe once a month or every three or four episodes. So look forward to having you guys regularly back at this table. You have to continue paying us in hazelnut coffee. <laughs> <laughs> hazelnut coffee with hazelnut creamer. This is a first that oh, we've witnessed that's today for the show. I just like my hazelnut coffee uh, neat. <laughs> Thanks, guys.
Grand Thamasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we referenced on this week's episode, visit our website, grandthamasha.com. Production assistance comes from Megan Maxwell and Rachel Osnos. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Lauren Dueck is our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.